When Michael Lloyd Reese and David Jaramillo disappeared in 1985, it would take more than 30 days for Reese's parents to report the 14-year-old missing. His seven-year-old sister, Thunder, tried to call police, but they refused to talk to the little girl. Instead, they told her to find an adult and make the report. Well, the problem was Thunder and her nine-year-old sister were probably the only adults in the family. They were certainly the only ones that seemed concerned enough that Lloyd was missing to call. Their parents were struggling with drug addiction and were rarely around, and they figured that Lloyd would eventually come home. But he didn't. It was June 3, 1985, when Lloyd Reese and his buddy David Jaramillo went out and stole a license plate off a vehicle in their neighborhood so that they could put it on David's unregistered brown Datsun B210. They hoped having the plate would minimize the risk of attracting the attention of police officers as they made their way to East Canyon Reservoir, some 60 minutes east of their home in downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. They drove through nearby Emigration Canyon and over the windy roads past Mountain Dell Reservoir and across the summit, finally descending into the valley where they parked their car at the northeast arm of the lake. Jaramillo's brother Perry and his girlfriend Felicia were in the car with them. There were some other witnesses in the area, including Perry, Felicia, and Jaramillo's father, who happened to be at the lake fishing. He recalled seeing the boys swimming in a section of the lake called Dixie Hollow. There, the water depth could reach 80 feet, a suitable hiding spot if they had accidentally drowned. But Jaramillo's dad reported to the Salt Lake City Police Department investigators that he recalled the boys leaving the lake without Perry and Felicia in the car. Their direction of travel is unknown and explored in our previous videos, but in those videos, we examined multiple theories to determine the most probable place to search for the boys. I hope that you'll go back and watch those, and if you haven't seen them, make sure you spend a little time. It'll give you more context to this case. After leaving the area, the boys simply disappeared. Folks, I hope you'll take a moment, hit the like and the subscribe button, and ring the bell so you get other notifications on videos like this one. Let's talk about this case a little further. The years passed by. Thunder continued to search and wondered about Lloyd, never forgetting the last moment that she spent with him. You'll hear her talk about that in a minute, but from time to time, law enforcement and other special interest groups filled her mind with hopes only to have him be sharing words and no action. Let's listen to a news report by veteran news reporter Marcus Ortiz from ABC News 4 about one of those false starts a few years ago. I spoke with Marcus many times over the years during my service in the Attorney General's office. I really appreciate his style. Let's watch. Missing. For 35 years, the whereabouts of Lloyd Reese and David Jaramillo still remains a mystery. They disappeared during an outing near East Canyon Reservoir. For every crime, there's a story and the truth matters. Here's ABC4 senior crime and punishment correspondent Marcos Ortiz with tonight's Justice Files. They just vanished, and police say their investigation into the disappearance of 14-year-old Lloyd Reese and 21-year-old David Jaramillo resulted in dead ends. Now there's a new effort to find them. He had decided with him and some friends wanted to go up to, you know, East Canyon Reservoir. He left and he never came back. Her brother, 14-year-old Lloyd Reese, and his friend, 21-year-old David Jaramillo, remain missing after 35 years. In June of 1985, they were with others at the East Canyon Reservoir when they become separated and disappear. I know that they had did a hunt. I know that they, I don't know if they had really did a really good sweep of East Canyon Reservoir. Um, I was really young, I was seven. But to date, they and the vehicle they were in have never been found. In 2010, Salt Lake City Police gather the families of Reese and Jaramillo to announce they plan to reinvestigate the case. It creates hope. Whether it's good or bad, uh, 
we just we just want some closure. But hope vanishes after the police investigation ends with no answers of their whereabouts. Oh, there's a lot of things that just doesn't add up. Like a lot of things don't add up to me as to why why nothing more has been done to find my brother. Police still list Reese and Jaramillo as missing. There's no evidence of foul play. But after 35 years, the Utah Cold Case Coalition plans to investigate it on their own. And they were last seen leaving that location. There's no other accounts, no other stories of them making it to any other destination. No other friends saw them in any other place, no family members. So either they ended up in the lake or they just vanished and I don't think they've vanished. The coalition will soon team up with volunteers from Utah State University to probe the bottom of the reservoir with an underground camera. Every time I hear about it, I really hope that, you know, I hope and pray that this one time it's gonna be that closure. Deep down inside, I know he's not alive because if he was alive, we would have heard from him by now. And so that kind of gives me a little bit of peace to know that he's not suffering. Something. She hopes there's answers at the bottom of the reservoir. The search for Reese and Jaramillo is scheduled for later this summer. For the Justice Files, Marcus Ortiz, ABC4 News. Then an anthropology student and YouTuber uh, named Sarah Clater reached out to Jared Lysick of Adventures with Purpose with a case she'd been looking into as a true crime enthusiast. Jared's interest was piqued, and before long, we were talking about the Reese Jaramillo case. Although we live nearly 800 miles apart, Jared and I started strategizing and planning. While he prepared his equipment and team for the long drive from the northeastern United States to Utah, I started investigating the case locally. I made numerous trips to East Canyon Reservoir, and I drove the same routes that David and Lloyd would have likely taken back in 1985, all the while looking for areas where the boys could have crashed or gone undetected. With the help of the Real-Time Crime Center in nearby Ogden, I spent days collecting drone footage and still imagery of the lake, the contours, and the road proximity to hazardous areas. Once we collected all that information, I started to analyze the data, and together we theorized that the boys either chose to exit the park area by traveling westbound, or they were simply driving around and lost control, plunging into the deep, murky waters of the reservoir. One area seemed particularly dangerous and included a place that didn't have any barriers to stop a vehicle if it was traveling too fast near a hairpin turn. This was along the northwest arm of the lake next to the dam. The water had remained unsearchable because it's in a federally protected section next to the dam. It's closed by a barrier and it's monitored 24 hours a day seven days a week. Well, after months of applications, phone calls, and discussions, Adventures with Purpose made the arduous journey to Utah. Just as they were crossing in the Utah border area in the 11th hour, the permits were finally signed by the United States Bureau of Reclamation. It, it wouldn't have happened without the support of Sheriff Blaine Brashears and Utah Parks Ranger and Manager Chris Haramoto. On the appointed day, we met at the boat docks in the early morning hours. It was a frenzy as everyone worked pulling boats and equipment from the AWP trailer. The amount of equipment was staggering. Sam Ginn, also known as uh, on YouTube as Sam Sam the Adventure Man, spoke briefly about the equipment. Well, right now I'm setting up my uh, dive gear, attaching my first stage regulator, which regulates the flow of air from this tank into the second stage regulator here, which uh, delivers at a pressure that's suitable for breathing. Without this, combing this down, it would just blow air like nobody's business. <laughs> so well, as the boats were being launched and loaded, we took a minute to visit with Thunder Alexander, Lloyd Reese's sister. Remember, this is the girl who tried to report her brother missing some 36 years earlier. She shared this memory of the morning that he left for the lake. So they weren't around very often. And so the day that they left, uh, it was just us kids at the house and some friends and everybody was partying. 
Well, my brother, two, both of my brothers had gotten in an argument and they had gotten in a fight. And so Lloyd decided that he was going to go to East County with some friends. They got in an argument over something, I don't know what it was. Um, they ended up getting in like a fist fight. And then Lloyd was, somebody offered for them to come up here. Lloyd took it up, took up the offer. He called my mom, wherever she was at, asked her for permission. She said yes. Um, he was getting ready to leave. I was crying, begging him not to go. Friends that were there at the house were begging him not to go. You know, I don't know, something just didn't sit well. Nobody wanted him to go. And to calm me down, he ended up walking to Circle K, which was on 17 South and State Street at the time. He took us down there and he stole me and my little brother a candy bar. And he walked me back and he broke it in. He sent me back up on the back of the car and he broke it in half and he gave half to my little brother and he gave half to me. And I was crying. I was begging him not to go. And he told me, he says, Thunder, I promise. He's like, I'm going to be back. He's like, I will be back in a little bit. He's like, just be good. Stay out of everybody's way. He's like, just go play your room. Go play with David. He's like, and before you know it, I'll be back. And he never came back. We paused for a moment when Dave Heavy D Sparks arrived at the boat ramp with his restored U.S. Army Vietnam River boat. He and his buddy, Dave Diesel Dave Kylie, brought their team in to assist. In all, we had nearly 20 people working to bring Lloyd Reese and David Jaramillo home. After the boats were loaded, we gathered together as one big group for a moment of silence and reflection, petitioning for help. And then we loaded into the four different boats and headed onto the lake in search of the missing boys. As Jared and Sam started running sonar in the northwest arm of the lake, a team of us went to the big metal barriers to gain access. Chuck Hadley of Stauffer Towing brought huge tools so that we could create an opening to get through the gate. It was a surreal moment as we entered the barricaded area. The lake's water level was low and seemed crystal clear. It was also evident that the lake was very, very deep. In fact, the charts show that in some places it's 200 feet deep. Early tests showed that the visibility at a depth of about 60 feet was less than two inches. There were dangerous undercurrents that we needed to contend with, caused by a spillway, a, a tunnel, where water is released from the dam and into the river on the other side of the concrete and still dam. High on the hillside overlooking the water stood two representatives from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and several sheriff's deputies. They were in constant communication with us as we prepared to search, and all of this was a constant reminder of the challenges that lay ahead. Listen as Jared Lysick from Adventures with Purpose describes what we expected and what we faced. We, you know, first of all, it comes back to the, we had to know what the contours were before we could even begin. Because here's the thing is, how deep is the lake? We as divers, you know, we can do 130, 140, yeah, 150 if we want to push it. Um, but here's the thing. Normally that lake is 160 to 180 feet deep. But we got really lucky because here we are at the end of summer. And so knowing that the deepest part of the lake is, you know, 160 plus and the water level is down 50 or 60 feet, that puts me, you know, right around 120 feet, which is actually what we ended up hitting on a couple of our dives there. That really helped out in our planning as to how we're going to tackle this. Because now what type of equipment do we need to bring as well? What we have on the boats is good to, you know, 50, 55 feet. But the moment we start getting over that, it really, you know, becomes a much different picture for us, especially when you're dealing with steep hillsides. And so then we know, all right, we need the tow fish instead of the regular side scan and down imaging equipment that we use on the boats. You know, my thoughts was, you know, absolutely, that is the location that if we're going to find any vehicles, it's going to be at that 90 degree corner. You know, as we did our sonar work and we actually dove, you know, we ended up finding a vehicle down there. And I'm not convinced that there's not more vehicles down there. You know, that we're dealing with the, e even in a pond, you have to think about this. We've received reports and we've seen 
ponds across the U.S. where you have a still body of water. It's flat. You have leaves that come in. You have dust that comes in. You have windstorms. And all of this, just like in, you know, the top of your refrigerator, eventually it's going to get covered. And the same thing is happening in these ponds to where a vehicle, in fact, I think there's one case that you were working on recently where the vehicle has been discovered, you know, 5, 10, 15 feet under the Silton settlement in a still pond where the entire pond needs to be drained. It just needs to be excavated in order to get to this vehicle that's been found on sub profiling or sub sub bottom uh, equipment. And so if you think about just a still pond, and now we're dealing with steep walls, you know, what are those like 45 degree, 40, 45 degree uh, walls coming in to the bottom of this. And over the course of 35 years, all that continues to roll down, roll down, roll down. Think about what the depth of that used to be and what the depth of it is now. And we could have, you know, we could have a dozen. Adventures with Purpose was in their boat examining the steep canyons approaching the dam. It was this area where a vehicle could have easily veered off the highway above and fallen over a hundred feet into the icy cold mountain waters where it could sink an additional 180 feet below the surface. Well, after several hours, Jared and Sam were able to say comfortably that there were no vehicles underwater in that portion of the lake. Now, we had previously cleared and eliminated two other areas on the lake, and our focus now turned to the dam. Listen as Jared describes that area that needed to be cleared. All right, so we've, we've done the uh, little inlet over there. We've done, you know, if it was going this direction, flying off at 90, like if you went back to Ogden and saw, oh, I'm heading the wrong direction, I'm going back to Salt Lake, let me come back around. Yeah. We didn't see anything over there. We had a potential way through a magnet on it. It's definitely a rock. Okay. Um, within here, because it's so deep, you know, this really it becomes not very effective other than, hey, here's what the depth is. Right. So now the game plan is we got the big toadfish. Uh, we know what the contours are in there. We cannot be running across the dam area. What we're going to be doing is we're going to take the toadfish out to that lower, lower dam and we're going to run it out so that way we can do 120 feet deep. Okay run it out and then if we need to move in and we'll pull the toe fish up to 50 feet or so and do another run and pass. There was only one potential target that we could kind of see on here that yeah it could be it was yeah. out of character from everything else that was down there so okay with that one we're gonna just set everything up. We then started slowly searching the entire lake bottom inside the closed barrier pulling the missile shaped toe fish across every inch of the lake's floor. The canyons were deep and steep. They were filled with large boulders. Listen as Sam Ginn describes what it was like down on the bottom, some 120 feet down. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, deep crevices and canyons and, you know, huge, you know, boulders the size of moving trucks. Um, you know, Jared and I, you know, you know, throwing, you know, the way the sonar works and, you know, trying to throw the, you know, the, you know, the sonar beams. It just, there's so many places, um, you know, that, there's so many cr cracks and crannies. It was just unbelievable. I mean, it felt like I was, you know, a lot of times it felt like I was underwater rock climbing, you know, when <laughs> I was down there. Um, it, just, it was just unbelievable. I, it was deep, dark. I, I actually, I'd never experienced, you know, a spot like that in all my diving. Um, so it really, really just blew me away just, you know, being a part of that and being able to search that area, you know, the best. The sonar provided a glimpse of the lake's bottom that wouldn't be noticeable otherwise, and, and it helped the team to identify areas where they could dive to inspect. Well, all the while they were working, Thunder and her daughter sat patiently in one of the boats nearby. Thunder recently shared how difficult that experience was when she spoke on Profiling Evil's choir practice about her concerns during the search. Let's listen. During the search... I was going through the emotions at the same time. And there was a part of me that like going up there in the morning, I just wanted to turn around and go back home because I was, I was scared. You know, I was like, what if they do pull him out? You know, what if they do pull the car out? And, but to know that you guys were up there supporting me and doing this for me, it gave me that strength to keep going, to keep driving, not to turn around and go back home, you know, and 
I'm just, I'm so thankful and to have my daughter up there. My daughter was up there with me. And then on day two, my stepbrother came up, which was awesome. You know, just all of you being there, it just, it made me so thankful for you guys even coming into my life. Once we identified the locations that were most promising, markers were placed in the water and the divers jumped in. It was an interesting experience to see how the AWP team created a, a metal marker and then fine-tuned its location in the water. Jared explained that once divers are in the water, it's easy to become disoriented, especially when the visibility is only a few inches like it was at the bottom. Being able to follow the rope down to the site that they'd identified as the one that they needed to look at made the process safer and much more manageable. Well, by noon on the first day of searching, Sam and Jared put their diving gear on and they headed into the depths of the waters in search of Lloyd Reese and David Haramiel. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Profiling Evil and the search for Lloyd Reese and David Jaramillo. We're on site at East Canyon Reservoir in Northern Utah and Adventures with Purpose, the Diesel Brothers and Profiling Evil are all out on the water with Lloyd's family. If you'd like to support Profiling Evil in projects like this, please visit our website and donate. Operations like this are time consuming and expensive. Please take a moment and subscribe to Profiling Evil on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. And you know what? I want to shout out to our friends at Dr. Pepper for taking care of us on this particular search. And of course, a shout out to our friends at Lifetime Products for their amazing coolers and outdoor products. Now let's get back to this episode as divers enter the water in search of the missing boys. Well, as Jared and Sam suited up for their dive, they carefully inspected each other's equipment as they prepared to enter the water. They wore insulated diving suits to protect them from the frigid temperatures down below where they pushed the limits of time and the depths. The minutes crawled and felt like hours passing as we anticipated word on what they were finding. As the first day came to a close, we learned that they had located at least one vehicle and possibly another at a deeper, unattainable depth. A license plate was recovered, causing us to question whether it could be the stolen license plate that the boys took and put on the brown Datsun B210. The markings on the plate suggested that it came from roughly the same time period in which Jaramillo's vehicle disappeared. Well, it was given to the sheriff's office for follow-up, and we're waiting to hear what the investigation unfolds. Take a minute and listen as Jared and I discuss this license plate a little bit. But we found another license plate, and there was a deeper canyon that just was physically impossible to get there. Well, and, and you think about the one that we found was actually on the hillside still. And so if you go down another, you know, 20 feet from where we were at, now it starts to level out. And now, you know, it, it could absolutely be underneath all that. And frankly, uh, Thunder, we kind of hold some hope that this other license plate, while we wait for that to come back, may tie to this case. Because I told something to Jared the other day that he wasn't aware of. And that was that the boys went out just before heading to the dam and stole a license plate off a car. And if we can tie that plate to near your home in Salt Lake City. Yeah, let me just touch on that license plate real quick. You know, it's a dealer plate from 78 is when the uh, plate was issued. You know, it was actually found up on an upper shelf around the 25 to 40 foot mark, which would in regular terms, if the water, you know, if the lake was full, you know, would be around 100 to, you know, 80 feet deep or so. But it was found on more of a ledge uh, more of a cliff ledge to where more exposed rocks to where it's not where all the silt and sediment comes down to settle. So if it came off, you know, as the car is going into the water, yeah, that car, if it was happened to be the same car, you know, it could absolutely be down in the bottom there still. Well, early the next morning, the team started rigging the vehicle that was located, hoping they would be able to bring it to the surface. 
Jared explained that the vehicle was almost completely submerged in the mud and silt. Slowly, the team marked other areas of interest, and we decided whether some things could be surfaced or not. During my law enforcement briefing with the sheriff at midday, I shared a short recap on what was going. We were standing up above. Listen in. Well, uh, today's a big day, day number two. There are a couple of things that are kind of important to talk about. First is that orange buoy out there is about 92 to 110, 115 feet deep. They've identified the vehicle down there. We don't know if it's Lloyd's vehicle, uh, but what we do know is there's a vehicle. Divers are down in the water now trying to figure out if there's a body in the car. If there is, then this becomes a crime scene that the sheriff's office has to take over. If not, in a couple of hours, then we're going to float this car to the surface and we're going to take it and uh, go all the way down, drag it on the surface down to the boat docks. And so those of you who want to come out about one o'clock, they're going to be loading that onto the Diesel Brothers vehicle and, and hauling that off or getting it to the sheriff's office as piece of evidence. The other thing that's kind of cool is our friends at Stoffer Towing, Chuck Hadley and his team, have uh, also been up here helping us from uh, a, a towing perspective. And one of the things that the Bureau of Reclamation has wanted for a long time to get rid of is this uh, big structure of, of uh, barrier and, and um, barrels and cement. So we're gonna bring the wrecker out and we're gonna pick that thing up and haul it up the hill. And we're gonna put it right here where it can be disassembled and moved over to the boat dock. So a big day, just a shout out to Adventures with Purpose, to Diesel Brothers, to Stoffer Towing, and all of you who have uh, supported us. The other thing that's kind of cool that it might be fun to talk about for a moment is that I was on the phone this morning with the Salt Lake City Cemetery. The Sexton is looking into whether we can use the Popper Cemetery as a place for a tombstone and a place of remembrance for the, the uh, Reese family and a place where we can put Lloyd's uh, headstone so they have a place to visit. So we hope more information will come out today on that. So keep tuned. We're going to keep doing our thing here, and thanks for your support. Well, after painstaking effort, Jared and Sam were able to put slings on the vehicle and attempt to raise it from the bottom of the lake. Remember, folks, this vehicle was nearly buried in mud. The only thing that could be used to free it from the bottom was the attached airbags that AWP had carefully positioned. They were filling it with air. Their first attempt to raise the vehicle failed when the door of the vehicle broke free and the car fell back to the bottom. The smell of decades-old fuel filled the air as the vehicle shifted enough to release some of the gas in it. While troubling, it was a good sign that progress was being made. Once the vehicle was stabilized, we motored back to the docks to regroup and consider our options. This search was getting more dangerous as the day went on. Jared and Sam had already made multiple dives. One diver who was helping with them became so cold and disoriented that he had to return to the boat. Another major issue was that Adventures with Purpose was low on air for their diving tanks. And we only had four hours left on our permit to dive in the federally protected waters. Listen as Sam Ginn explains why the break was so critical at this important time. Take a quick break. We need to let our nitrogen and our, and our bloodstream bleed off a little bit. We need to regulate our bodies. We're, and we're at pretty high altitude and we're diving deep. So we need to be real cautious and protect ourselves. So we're just taking a break. Connected to the B pillar and it just totally ripped apart. So, but however, that was enough movement to expose a better grab point. So Jared has a better purchase on it. And we're gonna have to lunch here, go back in, reconnect, and yank it out. As we discussed the options, we determined they were rather limited. The vehicle AWP identified on the lake floor was not Jaramillo's and Reese's Dotson B210. It was a Toyota, and it was glued to the bottom, cemented by decades of silt. The reality was another attempt at raising the vehicle just might be too risky. It, it wasn't only the depth of more than 100 feet. It was the number of deep water dives that Jared and Sam had already made. 
they were pushing the limits and the high mountain altitude wasn't helping. They were exhausted and mistakes could be made, placing their lives and those of everyone else on the surface at risk. No one wanted to quit, but we needed to be wise. At the boat docks, Ranger Chris Haramoto reviewed the situation with the team and the representatives from the Bureau of Reclamation. The Bureau was concerned with any negative impact the vehicle may have on the environment with the now leaking fuel tank. They considered pulling the plug to avoid spilling any more fuel into the lake. Haramoto and I talked about this tricky, particular search from an environmental standpoint and a coordination effort between private, county, state, and federal partners. Listen as we talk about this search and the discovery of a vehicle that we didn't even know was in the water. Yeah, I can't speak on, you know, any of the, the happenings probably before I even got here, which was almost 10 years ago because we've never had anything like that happen as far as I know. Um, but yeah, you know, in reservoirs like this and how deep they are, there's yeah definitely different things that are down in the bottom of this reservoir that I'm sure uh, only very few people know about. And, you know, operations like this will help kind of uh, showcase those and maybe hopefully find some, you know, if there are people missing, find those people. Well, after reviewing the risks and the hazards, the team decided we were going to make one more attempt at raising the vehicle from the floor of the lake. But we still faced one more unexpected challenge. We only had a few hours until the permit expired, and the feds didn't appear keen on allowing another day for the operation. It was going to take more than two hours to drive to town and get the air tanks filled. Then, Sheriff Blaine Brashears of the Morgan County Sheriff's Office hatched a plan. In concert with Deputy Austin Turner, they reached out to the local fire department and a dive master that they knew in the nearby community. Miraculously, they were able to find just enough air to make one more recovery attempt. Yes, to, to answer your question on, you know, the, the deepest, you know, hardest, most difficult recovery, you know, it has, it definitely was for the Diesel Brothers. And, you know, where do I rank it on our recoveries? You know, it was definitely the deepest one we've ever done. It was challenging. Uh, at no point have I ever done three back to back 100 foot dives in order to work on a vehicle recovery, plus a couple more 50 footers and some 20 footers. You know, so there was a lot of diving that day. Where, you know, I really rank it up there with a snowcat. With a snowcat, it was really difficult because that was at 80 feet deep. It was a 15,000 pound snowcat. It was a high mountain lake at 10,000 plus in elevation. So it was hard to breathe to begin with. And this one I put right up there with this one, with the snowcat, because of the number of dives, how deep they were. We're at elevation here at 5,700 feet or so. And then in addition to that, we had some challenges with, you know, we could only get to the B pillars to begin with, that we couldn't get to any axles to where, you know, we're having to do a staged lift to where we're, you know, ripping the vehicle apart. And, you know, when we blow those, uh, when we blow the B pillars out to where, you know, now we're having to go back down to, it's still a sketchy point that we even have connected to that we're still not around the entire axle. And we're putting, you know, nine to 12,000 pounds of lift on this one single point on the front uh, driver's wheel in hopes that we don't lose it a second time while we're also doing a stage lift that once we, and to, for those that don't understand what a stage lift is, we have a vehicle that's at 92 feet. We've attached to the vehicle at 92 feet with a line that goes up, but we've tied a, a loop right around 40 feet or so. So that way we're going to, as divers, be safer at 40 feet to do a staged lift. And so we put the float bags at that 40 foot mark to lift it up. And the reason why we don't do it at say 60 feet is because if we're doing it at 60 feet and anything happens down, you know, at this other 30 feet and it blows, that 30 feet is gonna come ripping right up through us and potentially, like imagine if that door would have come flying up and hit one of us. And so because, and so as long as we do that stage lift at less than half what that, what the depth is, if anything happens down here, which, which did happen. And so when that door came flying up, you know, it went up 40 feet, but it was still, you know, 10 to 20 feet below us, which kept all of us safe. And so once, and so then once we do the stage lift and now we have the bags at the surface, now we have the vehicle floating at, you know, 50 feet or so. 
Now we can come back down and reattach to the vehicle nice and solid and finish floating it. Thunder was supportive of whatever the team decided to do, but wondered if there might be a body inside the vehicle that sat at the bottom. She knew it wasn't Lloyd's or David's, but she hoped that we would find a way to try one more time, thinking it could bring closure to at least another family. We discussed the pros and cons of another dive amongst us and decided we were going to give it one last try. Those on the surface watched the bubbles exploding from below as Jared and Sam worked for nearly an hour to prepare the car for one more lift attempt. Air tank after air tank was taken from the boat and below the surface as they filled the large orange air bags. All of a sudden, we could see a hint of orange in the water. It grew larger and rapidly ascended and burst through the surface of the water. For a second, our hearts stopped beating as the bags lurched back and forth under the weight of the 12,000-pound vehicle that hung below. It was an incredible moment and feeling. Everyone broke into cheers. After securing the airbags and the cargo, we attached a line from the Diesel Brother boat and started pulling the car from the protected area. Let's watch this news account from Fox 13 News in Salt Lake City, Utah. Today, search teams are looking for clues in a cold case dormant for more than three decades. It was back in 1985, 14-year-old Lori Reese, along with 21-year-old David Jaramillo, were driving near East Canyon Reservoir. Well, they never returned home. Fox 13's John Franke shares what several search organizations have been able to discover. I'm very heartbroken. He made a promise that night that he was going to come home and he never came home. For 36 years, Thunder Alexander has felt helpless. She was just seven years old when her brother Lloyd Reese never returned home. My brother was an awesome person. Um, if anybody needed anything, he was the first one there. Now, all of these years old when her brother Lloyd Reese never returned home. My brother was an awesome person. She was seven years old when her brother Lloyd Reese never returned home. My brother was an awesome person. Um, if anybody needed anything he was the first one there now all of these people are here to help find him our specialty is underwater sonar search and recovery jared lysick is with a search team out of oregon called adventures with a purpose they teamed up with the diesel brothers and a utah youtuber to put this search party together took the area and took all the topography of the lake and all of the road surface areas and we plotted out the most probable place that a vehicle would be. Mike King is a retired law enforcement officer who now produces a YouTube show dedicated to cold cases. This search began to determine a likely place a car could have driven into the water. The theory is, is that two boys after drinking and partying came down a dark road at a high rate of speed and didn't navigate the corner. That's why when sonar detected a car below the corner of the highway, there was hope it would be the Dotson Reese and his friend David Jaramillo drove to the lake. Turns out, it was an early 90s Toyota, 100 feet below the surface. The vehicle still may be in there because uh, the divers said that the visibility is only four inches at um, uh, best at some depths, and the silt is so great that uh, the vehicle could be completely submerged by this point. As the sun set Wednesday evening after hours spent in a tug of war with the mud and silt, the Toyota reemerged, likely after years underwater. I almost gave up. Today's mission is complete, but Thunder Alexander's search is still far from over. I'm not giving up. Two boys don't just go missing, and I will keep fighting to find them. So as for this Toyota the Morton County Sheriff's Office ran the VIN number on the vehicle. It came back as stolen. I'm told it will now be taken to an impound yard in Ogden. At East Canyon State Park, John Franke, Fox 13 News, Utah. Well, it was then when our enthusiasm came to a halt as the vehicle became entangled with the metal cables that stretched below the surface, keeping that barrier in place. Was all this work for naught? We paused for a moment and considered our options. Stoffer Brothers could have easily pulled the vehicle up the side of the mountain, but we risked spilling fuel and creating a bigger environmental hazard. We wanted to pull the vehicle over to the boat docks where it could be winched onto a wrecker with the least amount of environmental leakage. 
We just happened to have a few remaining air tanks, and Jared and Sam quickly jumped back into the lake and attached more airbags, floating the entire vehicle much higher in the water where it could clear the barrier. Another round of cheers erupted as the boat and vehicle in tow motored away from the protected area and toward the boat docks, where it would be loaded onto a wrecker and taken into police custody. As we cleaned up and packed up the boats and equipment, there was a a sense of satisfaction amongst the search party. But the lingering hope and disappointment that Lloyd Reese and David Jaramillo weren't found hung over the group like a thick fog. We felt so bad for Thunder that we weren't able to find the boys. But Thunder was grateful for the amazing show of support, and she thanked everyone. Let's listen as she does that. So don't ever feel defeated. You guys gave it your all. And I have a feeling that you guys ain't going to give up. You know, everybody keeps telling me if there's one thing, you guys ain't going to give up. And and I believe that. I do. If something comes about with this license plate, I do believe that you guys will be the first ones there for me. Well, as a group, we weren't finished. We had promised Thunder that profiling evil would ensure that Michael Lloyd Reese, her brother, would have a burial spot with a headstone so that the family would have a place to visit him. You see, Lloyd had never been declared legally deceased. With donations from viewers on our YouTube channel, we were able to purchase a headstone with help from Robert Lindquist of Lindquist Mortuaries in Utah. We worked with Lee Benyon, the sexton at the Taylorsville, Utah Cemetery, and we secured a way to put Lloyd's headstone next to his brother who had died at infancy. Now the family will have a place to visit. Listen as Thunder shares the family's thoughts on Lloyd's burial spot. So, so Thunder, some, some great things may still happen, and, and there is something else that happened, and and this is the community that I wanted to get you on to be able to acknowledge as uh, Sam comes back in. One of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to take care of uh, providing a burial spot and a headstone for Lloyd. And we, uh, we have uh, been able to do that now. And you approved a beautiful stone a few days ago. The boys haven't seen it yet. So... Uh, um, Here's the stone that will go on Lloyd's uh, grave. And I don't know, maybe you could talk a little bit about that experience. So um, I'm just unbelievable. Thank, I'm just so thankful for everybody that has contributed to this. Uh, I wish that my family would have done this sooner and I don't know why they didn't. Um, but Every, I mean, all you people I haven't even met, and you guys have put your money into this to, to help me to be able to go somewhere and sit down. And even though he's not physically there, I'm still able to go there and talk to him like he is. I'm able to take my kids there. Um, his headstone's going to be put next to my brother who passed away when he was an infant of crib death and that just it means a lot to me to be able to go to one spot and be able to see my brothers and I'm just really thankful for everything that everybody has done to help me get this headstone and get this plot it really it means a lot to me (laughs) so Lloyd used to always uh play the air guitar He would grab a broom and pretend like he was playing the guitar. So when we were thinking of what to put on the headstone, me and my sister were like racking our brains on what to put there because I didn't want to put a broom because I just didn't want to put a broom, obviously. And so my sister's like, what about a guitar? She's like an electric guitar. She's like, that fits him. That's what, that's what he, you know, loved to do. She's like, and, and that's what reminds me of him. That's memories I have of him is playing the broom in the air guitar. So when I look at this headstone, it just, it, it just makes my heart super warm because 
if anything he would have wanted on his gravestone, it would have been that. Well, we want to thank all of you who offered financial help with Lloyd Reese's search and burial. These kinds of operations are expensive, and your donations really do make a difference. If you'd like to donate to Profiling Evil, you can do so by going to our website and follow the donate links. Or consider joining our channel memberships. It's just another way that you can use your donation to do more good. Now, if you can't afford it, don't sweat it. <laughs> We're still here for you. But oh, how we thank those who can give us a little bit of help. Hey, folks, if you like this video, please consider hitting the like and the subscribe button. When you do so, make sure you ring the bell so that you receive all of our notifications. I want to say thanks to our friends at Adventures with Purpose, Sam Sam the Adventure Man, Heavy D Sparks, and the Diesel Brothers for teaming up with us on this search and rescue case. Thanks for your support of Profiling Evil. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene.